Chapter 5 is about air pressure. Our driving question, what is the significance of horizontal and vertical variations in air pressure? The chapter opens with a case in point study about air pressures on Mount Everest. Mount Everest, of course, being the world's tallest mountain, just over 29,000 feet. It is at the same latitude as Tampa, Florida, but because temperatures decrease with altitude, the temperatures are very different than what we see in Florida, with the average summer temperature being negative 2 degrees Fahrenheit. In addition, it's very stormy and dangerous conditions that high in the atmosphere. There's very thin air. There's less atmosphere, as we'll learn, the higher up we go in elevation. And uh, people that climb this mountain have a small window of opportunity to make the ascent. And even then, there's no guarantee uh, that they'll make it given the, the harsh conditions. Air pressure is essentially the weight of the overlying air. Dalton's law, which you can read about in the book, basically says that the total pressure exerted by a mixture of gases, such as our atmosphere, is the sum of the pressures produced by each of the constituent gases. So if we break the atmosphere down into its constituent components like uh, water vapor and nitrogen and oxygen and so forth, we can look at the individual pressure exerted by each of those gases and then simply sum them up to get a total for the atmosphere. Here you see two chambers uh, that shows the same number of air molecules or gas molecules in a container. And when we have more area in the container for those molecules to spread out, we have less density. The molecules are spread out, therefore less dense. We have lower pressure. If we decrease the volume but keep the number of molecules the same, the molecules become more densely packed and therefore the pressure increases. Air pressure is measured with an instrument called a barometer. A commonly used barometer is called a mercury barometer, similar to a thermometer with mercury. It's a glass chamber that's filled with mercury. Unlike a thermometer, however, for which the mercury is contained in the glass, with a barometer, the mercury is actually open to the atmosphere. So this uh, glass chamber here, the column, is uh, exerting a pressure onto the mercury reservoir and then the mercury itself is having the atmospheric pressure exerted on it. So the higher the pressure, the more it pushes on this mercury and it, the more it will push the mercury in the glass chamber up. The values are read in inches or millimeters of mercury. So there'd be a scale on this glass chamber that would tell us how many inches it is. Here you see sea level pressure for um, inches of mercury, 29.92, and millimeters of mercury. You can also measure air pressure with an aneroid barometer, which has a metal chamber and springs. And you can see here the inner workings of the barometer. There's a chamber that has a partial vacuum, and then changes in air pressure collapse or expand the chamber and affect the spring, which drives the pointer that points on the scale where we are in our pressure values. So these we typically see for home use. It will look something similar to what you see here, and it usually says fair weather, stormy weather, and so on, and that's simply just based on the fact that the pressure is high or the pressure is low. High pressure, as we'll see, typically is associated with fair weather and low pressure with stormy weather. We can also measure air pressure with a barograph, and a barograph is a barometer that's linked to um, a pen and a, a roll of paper like you see here so that what we end up with is a continuous record of the of the um, air pressure instead of just getting a single reading we have a record of what the pressure has done over a period of time that way we can get what's called the pressure tendency which is the change of pressure over time so we can see is the pressure increasing or decreasing with time so we can better forecast the weather Air pressure is measured in a variety of different units. If we're using something like the mercury barometer, we would measure it in millimeters or inches, as we saw. Um, pressure units, the classic is Pascal's, named after Blaise Pascal. It is a measure of pressure, and uh, we can see the sea level pressure, which is kind of a, a standard norm for getting pressure values. 
the sea level pressure would be 1,000, excuse me, 101,325 pascals, or we can break it down into hectopascals and kilopascals. This is metric system. In the U.S., however, we use bars, and one bar is 29.53 inches of mercury, and we break it down further into millibars. So sea level pressure in millibars is 1,013.2 and the typical range of millibar values that you see is here 970 through 1040 millibars the lowest ever recorded in a typhoon very low pressure in the center of a strong hurricane typhoons as they're called in the Pacific Ocean 870 millibars and the highest ever recorded was in Siberia 1083.8 millibars and you can see here different conversion factors for moving among the different units that define air pressure the way that air pressure varies with altitude is exponential decrease. So here you see our air pressure values in millibars and our altitude in the atmosphere. Most of the atmosphere is located close right at the surface of the Earth. That's because remember pressure is basically the weight of the atmosphere. And because of gravity, right, most of that weight is going to be close to the Earth's surface. And as we go higher, it decreases exponentially until it just kind of peters out at some unknown location up into space. There's no definite marker where the atmosphere ends, the pressure of the atmosphere ends. It just kind of slowly blends into space. So you see here some statistics. Half the atmosphere's mass is below 5,500 meters, or 18,000 feet, and 99% of the mass is below 20 miles. And we see Denver, Colorado, which is the mile high city. It's got an elevation of approximately a mile. Um, its average air pressure is 83% of that of Boston, Massachusetts. So if you live in a high elevation location, you have less air pressure than lower elevations. And we in Arizona are very familiar with this because we have a very topographically rich state with high points in Flagstaff and low points in the lower valleys like Phoenix and points further south. So we want to see how pressure, air pressure varies horizontally so we can get kind of an idea of what's happening. And the map that you see here shows isobars, lines of equal pressure. So isoline, remember, is the general name. And then we have different specific types of isolines. So an isobar is a line of equal barometric pressure. And when we draw isolines, we can identify high cells and low cells, high pressure and low pressure cells. Now, when we look at a map like this, remember the U.S. is a topographically rich country. So we have high elevations in the west compared to the east and lots of topography in between. So what we do is we normalize the pressures to sea level values so that we can then compare everything and get um, a single look at what's happening with pressures across the country or even the world. So typically, if we have falling air pressures, we know that storms are on the way. And if we have rising air pressures, we have fair weather on the way. And here we see a barograph reading for a location in Wisconsin that shows uh, pressure throughout a few days, a, a time period of a few days, and we can see that it decreases, then increases, then whoa, it really dips down low, and there in fact was a storm that passed through during that time period. So when we look at the influence of temperature on pressure, it behaves differently in the lab than it does in the actual atmosphere. And that's because in the lab we have confined chambers where we can investigate what happens with pressure as we add or decrease temperature. Whereas in the atmosphere we can't confine the air to a location. So in the lab, if you increase the temperature, it causes the kinetic energy of the gas to increase, which causes the pressure to increase. This is in a closed container and because it's a closed container the density does not change and we're not adding or removing any air. Now if we look at what happens in the actual atmosphere we see that pressure is inversely related to temperature which means that as you increase one you decrease the other. So if we increase air temperature 
the kinetic energy increases, same as in the lab. But now, because there's no confined space, the molecules are free to spread out in the atmosphere. And when the molecules are placed farther apart, they have a lower density, and a lower density means a lower pressure. So in general, as, we, as the atmosphere air is heated, it becomes less dense and lighter, which makes for lower pressure. Here's an example demonstrating pressure, hot air balloons. If you've ever had the experience of going up in a hot air balloon or even just watching one, which I'm sure you all have, the way these work is the hot air balloon uh, represents a, a chamber here. And hot air, air is heated and forced into the balloon. And as it's forced into the balloon, it expands the balloon a bit and it causes the balloon to rise in the atmosphere because hot air is less dense than the surrounding cooler air. And then uh, once it's reached a, a happy altitude, the temperature, the heat, is um, not turned on and slowly the balloon sinks as the air inside the balloon cools off and becomes more dense. It causes the balloon to sink and then um, if you have paid for a long ride, the guy will fire up the balloon again and it will rise back up in the atmosphere. So a few general statements here on how air masses affect the, the weather, the pressure. Cold, dry air masses are the densest. So think of one that's coming from um, Canada or further north. Something that's very cold and dry is going to have very high pressure exerted on the surface. Warm, dry air masses have higher pressure than warm, humid air masses. So these pressure differences create horizontal pressure gradients. So remember a gradient is the change in something, in this case pressure, with distance. So when we get this kind of a gradient, we end up with the possibility of movement. Remember the the nature does not like things to be ordered. So if there's high pressure in one area, low pressure in another area, nature wants to equalize those. And in this case, we'll have winds blow that can be uh, representative of warm or cold air advection as we saw in chapter four. So the grand conclusion here is that local conditions and air mass advection can influence air pressure. So the, the basic underlying story here is that air pressure is very complicated. It's not something that's easy to um, say if this happens, then that is going to happen in the atmosphere as opposed to the lab because the different variables interact with one another and it's very difficult to make generalizations. However, we can identify areas of high and low pressure as we saw with isobars on a map. And with isobars, the convention in the US is to draw them at four millibar intervals such that the 1000 millibar isobar is on the map. So you would have 1,000, 1,004, 1,008, and so on. And even below 1,000, it could go to 996, 992, and so on. Once we draw the isobars, which have been equalized for sea level pressure, we can identify areas of relative high and relative low pressure. So there's no cutoff point of what determines a high or a low pressure cell. It's just relative to the surrounding air. So let's look at the circulation patterns in lows and highs. So down here is the surface, up here is the upper air. So if we have a low pressure cell in the surface, remember that nature does not like to have these, these um, ordered situations where there's low pressure and high pressure. And so what happens is the atmosphere tries to equalize these situations. So air is going to come rushing in to an area of low pressure to try to equalize it. And as the air comes in, this is called convergence, when we have air coming in to a low pressure cell, it's forced to rise in the atmosphere. And once it rises in the atmosphere, it begins to spread out and we have upper air divergence. And so there's a high pressure that forms in the upper atmosphere over a low surface pressure. So when we have a surface low 
it's accompanied by an upper air high. And surface lows have convergence of air, which then rises, and then in the upper atmosphere it diverges. Just the opposite happens with a surface high. The atmosphere wants to equalize the pressure so it pulls winds out of the high. So air goes rushing out of the high pressure cell, which leaves a vacuum, a space for air to sink down into the high from aloft. And then upper atmosphere conditions create a low because it allows for circulation to come in. So basically what we get here is a circulation cell that would be something like this if we look at it vertically on either side of, in this case, the high pressure cell and same thing with the low pressure cell. So again, we have uh, surface high with diverging air and the corresponding upper air low with converging air. Now with the surface low, I mentioned that surface lows are typically associated with stormy weather and this is why we have this uplift of air and with this uplift comes the potential for cloud development and if it's rapid intense cloud development it could bring the potential for severe storms. So all of our storms that we'll study later in the course are basically low pressure systems whether they're hurricanes or tornadoes or even a big uh, squall of thunderstorms versus high pressure, which is fair weather, when we have this sinking air, there's no real opportunity for cloud development and therefore no stormy weather. Let's look at expansional cooling and compressional warming. Compressed air has a higher temperature. So if you have a chamber with a piston, like you can imagine here, and you can compress the air, you are making the molecules more densely uh, packed and therefore increasing the temperature versus when the the air chamber is expanded, the air parcel is expanded, the molecules can spread out and the temperature decreases. An example of this is like with a bicycle pump, a hand pump of any sort. When you're pumping air into a bike tire or a exercise ball or whatever, you'll notice that as you compress the air, the pump itself becomes warm. So this leads us into the discussion of adiabatic processes. And an adiabatic process is one for which no heat is exchanged between an air parcel and its surroundings, in this case the surrounding atmosphere. So if we look at a parcel of air that is ascending or descending in the atmosphere, we want to see how its temperature changes simply as a result of the process of expansion or compression of that air parcel because of the surrounding air pressure. And we'll see this in just a moment on a chart, but this is the idea behind an adiabatic process. When we talk about adiabatic processes, we have to distinguish between dry air and moist air because the process is a little bit different. For dry air, we have something called the dry adiabatic lapse rate, and it describes the decrease of temperature with elevation in the atmosphere. And the driving force here, as we'll see in a moment, is pressure. And the actual dry adiabatic lapse rate is about 10 degrees Celsius for every thousand meters. So as you go up a kilometer in the atmosphere, the dry air temperature decrease is about 10 degrees Celsius. If we look at it in um, our units that we use in the US, it's about five and a half degrees Fahrenheit per thousand feet. If we look at moist air, the moist adiabatic lapse rate is a little bit lower. It's about six degrees Celsius per 1,000 meters or kilometer and that converts to 3.3 degrees Fahrenheit per thousand feet. Now notice this is averaged together because it depends on how much moisture is in the atmosphere. So let's take a look at the dry adiabatic cooling process. In this graph we have the surface down here at the bottom and we go higher up in the atmosphere so we see altitude increases and then here's air pressure which we've seen um, is highest at the surface and decreases as we go higher up.
So we have a theoretical parcel of air and it starts off here at 1000 meters in the atmosphere and it's at 10 degrees Celsius. As that parcel rises higher in the atmosphere, it expands. And as it expands, the molecules spread out and it becomes less dense and therefore the temperature decreases. So this is the dry adiabatic lapse rate. It decreases at 10 degrees Celsius per thousand meters. So by the time it reaches 2,000 meters height, its temperature is now zero degrees Celsius. It will continue to rise if it's warmer than its surrounding uh, atmospheric temperature. It continues to expand and as it expands it cools for the same reason. The density decreases and therefore the temperature also decreases at the dry adiabatic lapse rate. If we add moisture into the picture, we start with the same process. So here is uh, the dry adiabatic lapse rate taking place in the lower atmosphere. As we've just seen, it's about 10 degrees Celsius per 1,000 meters. So the air is cooling at that rate and the air parcel continues to rise and cool. And if there's any moisture in the form of water vapor in this air parcel, at some point, if it reaches high enough in the atmosphere, it will reach its dew point temperature. And the dew point temperature is the temperature at which water vapor in the air condenses out into water. So it's where dew forms, the level of condensation. And once that air parcel reaches that level, any moisture that it was carrying in the form of water vapor condenses out onto atmospheric debris, as we'll talk about in a future chapter, and it develops, it causes cloud formation. And when we reach this point, we suddenly are thrown into the moist adiabatic lapse rate because now we have latent heat being given off in this process of moving from water vapor to liquid water. So it changes the lapse rate to a much lower value. Okay, so that concludes this lecture. Be sure to read the corresponding chapters in the book, and we'll talk again soon. Bye for now.